is our second week of Advent. Now, Advent is the fancy word that we use to describe the season leading up to Christmas. As I said before, it's, it's a season of joy. It's a season of, of expectation and anticipation as we are looking forward to, to what is to come. And we express these feelings a lot of times through song. We sing the song, joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Or, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. We, we sing these songs. We, we are expectant. They, they help us to, to get into the Christmas spirit. I mean, they, they set the tone for the season, a, a, a tone of, of peace on earth. And, I mean, let's face it, they kind of give us the warm fuzzies inside. They make us feel good. They, they, they remind us of all things Christmas. But those feelings that we get from these songs, they are just that. They are feelings. The feeling of of peace on earth, we know that the world is not perfect, that the world is not trouble-free as much as we want it to be at Christmas. The problem that we face is this, this dichotomy, this, this dilemma that is created with all this Christmas hype. All of the, this Christmas spirit, it, it sets for us expectations of what is to come. All this anticipation that is building up for this one day, this day when we celebrate Christmas, this day when, when, we, when we open all the presents, when we have that big family get together, when, when everything is building up to that one moment, that one event, that one day, and in all of those things that we do, we find some level of satisfaction. But if you're like me, every year, there's something missing. You get that, that feeling on Christmas Day. You, you've spent the day, the, the kids have opened their presents, and, and you've had the big meal, and everybody's stuffed, and you've cleaned up everything. And then you finally settle down, and you sit on the couch. Everyone's doing their thing. Take a breath and think, is, is that it? Is it over? Was that all that we were living up to? We, we have this, this sense of disillusionment. You've been hyping this thing, some of us, for months. And it never seems to live up to the hype. How can we avoid this, this disillusionment? How can, we, how can we keep this hype from, from reaching this seemingly inevitable end? I think the answer to this question is found in one of the classic Christmas stories. The story of the Magi, or, or the story of the wise men. Now these men that, that came and saw the baby Jesus, they are most commonly known for bringing presents, for giving gifts to Jesus. Now if we look at history, and we've assumed through songs and whatever that there were three wise men, but we don't really get a number. That number is kind of derived from the three gifts that are given. But we just know that it's wise men or magi. There are multiple. It could be two, could be a hundred. We don't really know a number. But we know that they brought gifts to Jesus. And it's believed that this is the basis for why we exchange gifts at Christmas. Because Christmas is synonymous with gift giving. You can try and do away with it, but we have a, a desire to, to follow this tradition every Christmas. We know, you and I know, Jesus is the reason for the season. We understand that the, the reason that we do all of that is because of him. But let's face it, we're looking forward to the presence, especially the kids. They may know that Jesus is the reason, but they're excited for the presence. And as adults, you know, we can understand the the two parts to it, and many times we can decry the, this whole aspect of Christmas, the, the gift giving, the, the commercialization. All of this giving of presents, is, it, it's caused us to miss the true meaning of Christmas. 
To be honest, I don't think God is opposed to us giving gifts to each other on Christmas. And that's where some of you are breathing a sigh of relief. <sighs> I thought he was going to tell us to not give it any presents this Christmas. But no, I don't think God's opposed to it. In fact, the, the very first Christmas, Christmas began with a gift being given. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That's why we celebrate Christmas, because God gave to us. And that tradition continues through the wise men. We find their story in, in Matthew chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn there with me. But at the beginning of, of Matthew chapter 2, this is what we read. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. If we're going to solve this problem of disillusionment, of, of dissatisfaction in Christmas, we're going to have to approach Christmas differently. If we do the same thing we do every year, we're going to get the same result that we get every year. And so I want you guys to, to ask yourself three questions about how you are going to approach Christmas this year. The first question being, what are you seeking? What are you expecting out of Christmas? What do you need Christmas to be for you? Because your satisfaction will be directly related to your expectations. Are you expecting a white Christmas? There's a very good chance you're going to get that. Are you expecting a, a certain gift? A certain present, or, or at least in this realm or this category, this is what I, I really hope that I get. And how will your Christmas be affected if you don't receive that? Or even if you do receive it, if you get your white Christmas, if you get that present, how will your Christmas be affected? Because those expectations that we set, what we are seeking out every year, that's what brings us to that moment at the end where we say, is that it? Was that all there is? Is it over? That, that feeling is, is the result of that anticipation and that expectation. And the reason that we end in that way every single year, I would argue, is because we make Christmas too small. Let's look back to the wise men. God uses these men to point us to the right thing. Now, who are these wise men, these, these magi? I'm not going to go into like a deep dive of their history, but they were foreign mystics. They came from a foreign land, probably like Persia or Babylon or something like that. And they probably held to a religion of Zoroastrianism where they, they looked to the stars for answers. They, they looked to the stars for, for divination, for, for fortune telling, to, to tell them what was going on in the world. They didn't have newspapers or stuff like that. So they looked to the stars and if something happened up there, it meant that there was something big happening down on earth. They were not looking for God. They were not looking to the stars, hoping to find the, the God of Israel, the creator of the heavens and the earth. They understood that there was something more. They knew that there was more to life than just, you know, eating and sleeping and, and trying to survive. They didn't know what, but they knew there was more. And so they looked out to the heavens. Something was missing, and they were searching for it. And really, that's how all of humanity is. This has been shown over and over again through psychological studies. It reinforces this idea that humans are worshipers. We want, we, we need, we desire to worship someone or something. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody is a closet Christian just waiting to, to confess their true belief in God. That's not what that means at all. These magi, they understood that there was something more. And so they were looking for, they were seeking out something beyond themselves. And that's what each and every human being is doing as well. 
They may not consider themselves spiritual. They may not even adhere to there being anything supernatural in this world. But they have faith in something. They have a, a commitment to, to something. We all worship something. Some of us worship God, the creator of heaven and earth. Others worship Allah or, or the Hindu gods. Some people worship themselves. Or they worship the, the sexual experience or they, they worship their family. They focus on their jobs or, or money or, or all of their material possessions. All of these desires, all of these things that we seek after, they demonstrate that exact same desire that is innate within us, that desire to worship. That longing to find something outside of ourselves, something that is worthy of our attention, that is worthy of our worship. And whatever that object is, will determine your satisfaction in worship. Because whatever it is that you worship has to be worthy of your worship in order to find that satisfaction. And we know the reason for the season is Jesus. And so many of us in this room are, are seeking Jesus. We want to find Jesus in all of this. And so we begin looking for Jesus, but we look to everything besides God. We look to the decorations, to the Christmas tree. We look to the presents under the tree. We look to that shopping experience and finding that right gift. We, we look to the, the children's Christmas program, which is taking place just a couple weeks from today. We, we look to those holiday parties or that, that time that we get together with family. And each one of those things, to a certain extent, brings us satisfaction. But that satisfaction is only momentarily fulfilling. And it always builds up that anticipation and we come to the end with that same feeling of disillusionment and dissatisfaction when everything's just done. Every year, we do the same thing. And really, that's what Paul describes as he's writing to the church in Rome about how we worship. Tell them they traded God's truth for a lie and they worshiped and served the creation instead of the creator. That's what we do. Over and over again, as we are seeking out, we end up worshiping things. We end up worshiping that which is not worthy of our worship. And so I will ask you again, what are you seeking? What are you looking for? What are you expecting this Christmas season? Because what you are seeking is going to determine the satisfaction in what you find. But additionally, you need to ask yourself, where are you looking? There's a very often overlooked aspect in this story. And it, the story of the wise men, as we read in just, just Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, it says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. Did you catch it? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. These, these wise men from the east, they came looking for him, and they came looking for him in Jerusalem. They came looking for the king of the Jews, but they came looking in the wrong place. And they began asking questions, seeking out where is the king of the Jews? And it says in, chapter, in verse 4, he gathered all the chief priests and the legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote, you Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Now, you guys probably don't know a whole lot of geography as, as it comes to Jerusalem, but geographically, Bethlehem is about six miles 
from Jerusalem. It could be considered a suburb of Jerusalem. Right now, if, if you wanted to, you could get online and you could get an Uber from Bethlehem to Jerusalem and it would take you about 20 minutes. If, if you use the transportation mode of that day, it was about a 90 minute walk. I mean, that's like a day trip. How many people don't even think twice about driving to Minot for the day or driving to Bismarck for the day? That's about a 90 minute drive. It's about the same amount of time that it would take to go from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. It was not that far away. The wise men began looking for the king of the Jews. And when they began looking for him, they began to look where human wisdom, where, where human reasoning told them that he would be. They're looking for the king of the Jews. What better place to look than in the capital city of Israel, Jerusalem? But their looking in that place caused some problems. As we're told in verse 3, Herod was deeply troubled and the people with him were as well. This child threatened his rule. And so he used the information that he had, the information gathered from the wise men and, and the information gathered from the prophets and, and the, the religious leaders to try and eliminate the competition. He would go on to, to slaughter countless children that even remotely matched the description. They turned to the religious leaders to find where this child would be born. And they began pouring through all the scrolls, trying to figure out where God said this Messiah would be born. And they're like, oh yeah, he's, he's just down the road, about six miles or so. It's really interesting. These guys, these religious leaders whose lives were devoted to the Scriptures and, and to following God, they knew where the Messiah was to be born. They had people come and tell them, hey, we think this is happening right now. But the religious leaders never went to check it out. I mean, maybe they did and we just don't have any record of it. But I would think that if they went and they found this baby Jesus, that Herod would have had a much easier time finding him as well. It's more likely that we don't have any record of them going to see the baby Jesus because they never did. They were a day trip away from the Messiah, the, the one that they had waited for. And they never went to check it out. But this is exactly what John said in his gospel. The light has come to his own people and his own people didn't welcome him. And we can look at these guys and we can say, man, I can't believe they would do that. They're so close. Why didn't they just go check it out? Why didn't they just go look? But we do the same thing. Every year we, we celebrate Christmas and we do so without looking to Christ. A 2005 Barna survey found that 88% of Americans identified as Christian. Now, those numbers have probably changed in the last 16 years. But at that time, 88% of Americans identified as Christian. Now, of that 88% of people who identified as Christian, a second question was asked. What is the most important aspect of Christmas? And of those Christians that, that answered that survey only 33% said it was the birth of Jesus. 44% said that it was time spent with family. Over 50% of people who identify as Christians failed to identify Jesus as the most important aspect of Christmas. And it's the same problem that we have every year. We try to we, we seek Jesus. We, we try to find Him in, in all the stuff that we do, in all the same traditions that we do every year, gathering together with friends and family and, and doing all the presents. And, and we look for satisfaction at Christmas. And every year, we end up dissatisfied and disillusioned. 
if we're going to overcome this, if we're going to change, if we're going to choose something different, then we need to learn from the example of the wise men. When they heard the king, they went and looked. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They came to Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews. They came to the place where human wisdom told them that they would find the king of the Jews. But they didn't find him. They did not find satisfaction there. So what did they do? They didn't keep looking around Jerusalem. They didn't keep doing the same things that they did every time. Instead, they kept looking. Instead, they, they didn't give up. They went somewhere else. They, they, they tried something else. Now, we're all familiar with how this story goes. We're all familiar with what happens next, and that leads us to our third question. What do you give? The wise men are known for giving gifts. I mean, there, there's the whole song about we three kings that bringing presents from afar. And that's what we find in the story. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. And they, then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They gave him gifts, the presence of, of gold, the, the gift that is fit for a king, of frankincense, a, an incense that is used by priests in service of God, and myrrh, strange gift for a child, an embalming oil, one used in, in anointing. They sought the king of the Jews, and when they found him, they gave him gifts. Christmas is for giving. We know that. There's a reason we do it every single year. But the question is, what are you going to give this Christmas? Now, I could go over all the top-rated gifts, all the things that, that they're saying are the best presents to buy this Christmas. But everything on that list is going to fall short, just like every Christmas. It's going to end in the same dissatisfaction that we experience every single Christmas. It will end the same way, in disillusionment and dissatisfaction. So let me give you a different idea. A different idea of what you can give this Christmas. Give yourself. First and foremost, give yourself to God. Now, this is arguably the most costly gift that you could ever give. Giving yourself to God is going to cost you your time. Giving yourself to God is going to cost you your money. It will cost you your talent. Giving yourself to God is going to cost you your comfort. It will make you uncomfortable. God will stretch you in ways that you don't want to be stretched. And arguably, that's why we don't do it. That's why we don't give ourselves to Him. Because we're comfortable the way we are. We like doing Christmas the way that we do it every single year. We're used to it. We're comfortable with it. We don't want to give ourselves to God and make ourselves uncomfortable. So instead... We just add Jesus to the rest of our life. We, we add Jesus as just one more member of the family, as just one more thing that we have to do, that we have to pay attention to. And then when time runs short, when, when we run out of paycheck and, and money gets tight, then Jesus is one of the first things to go. Well, I don't have time to do this stuff with Jesus. I don't have time to, to spend with Jesus, so I'll just put that aside. I'm going to focus on all these other things that I have to do. Or I don't have enough money to, to give to this or, or that. Or So I'm just going to, to focus on what I need to focus on. And we end up celebrating Christmas 
the holiday that is centered around the birth of Christ, we celebrate Christmas without Jesus. And that's because we don't come prepared. We don't anticipate what is to come. As we look to the wise men, it says that the Magi opened their treasure chests and gave these gifts to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have a treasure chest at home, let alone a treasure chest filled with gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I haven't checked, but I'm pretty sure that's not something that you can just go pick up at the corner store. Oh, I'm in Jerusalem. Let me just stop at the store and I'll, I'll get a present for the, the king of the Jews. They don't sell chests or treasure chests full of gold, frankincense, and myrrh at the corner store. These guys planned ahead. They filled their chests. They carried their treasures with them when they left. They, they set out with this goal of finding the king of the Jews. And they prepared. They prepared themselves to give him gifts. Luke chapter 14 tells two different parables. One of them about a man building a tower and another about a king who's preparing to go to war. And as Jesus explains those two parables, they have the same meaning. You need to count the cost. You need to be prepared for what is to come. These magi knew what they were seeking. And they knew what it would cost them. I can imagine that there were other magi or, or wise men who chose not to come with them because they didn't want to pay the price. But they knew who they were seeking and they knew the cost associated with it. And the same should be true for you and for me. As we, as we choose to approach Christmas by giving ourselves to God, because Christmas is forgiving. So in addition to giving yourself to God, give yourself to others. Now what does this mean, like practically speaking? Practically speaking, it means don't give a gift just because you have to, just because you're supposed to. Give of yourself. Give your time. Give your energy. Give a gift. If you're going to give somebody something, give a gift that says, I know you. I understand who you are. Give a gift that is personal on some level. We don't need more gift cards. We don't need something else that's going to just sit at the bottom of a toy box or something that's just going to sit in a box in the garage. We have plenty of those things. The best gifts are not the ones with the highest price tags. The best gifts are the ones that come from the heart. And so this Christmas, I am absolving you of the responsibility to buy a present for everybody that you know. If they have a complaint about it, you can just tell them the pastor told me not to do it and I got to listen to everything he says. You don't have to buy a present for everybody under the sun. I know you love them. You want to give them something. But the only gift that is truly worth giving is yourself. Give to them a thoughtful gift. Give them your love and, and your kindness. Offer them hope and, and help, especially to those people who are hurting. Give them, give them the gift of your presence. Not presence under the tree, but being present, being there, being attentive. Putting the phone down putting all the distractions away and, and focusing your attention on those people that you love and care about the most. Probably one of the hardest, yet most important gifts that you can give is forgiveness. That relationship that has been strained. Offer the olive branch. Let them know I'm, I'm willing to try and work things out. 
I'm willing to, to give you another chance. I, I'm, I'm willing to step out in faith. Probably more important than that. Give them the gift of Jesus. Take some time and read the Christmas story together. Or as you're gathering at the big family gathering, when everybody's sitting down to that meal or, or getting ready to open presents or whatever it may be, offer to say a prayer to include Jesus in that celebration. This Christmas, give yourself to God and give yourself to those around you, your friends and your family, because this Christmas can be different. It doesn't have to end the same way that it always does. This Christmas can be better. Or it can end in the same dissatisfaction and the same disillusionment that you experience every year. The result will depend on how you choose to approach Christmas. What are you seeking? What are you expecting? What do you need Christmas to be? Because whatever you are seeking is going to determine your satisfaction in it. Are you seeking something that is worthy of your worship? And where are you looking for it? Are you looking to where human wisdom tells you that you will find it? Are you looking in, in the traditions that you do every single year? Or are you looking to God? Are you looking to the one who can satisfy? And when you find him, what are you going to give? The best gift of all is yourself. And how you approach Christmas, your satisfaction in this holiday season is all going to be determined by how you choose to approach it, what you are looking for, what you are seeking, and what you choose to give. Because Christmas is forgiven. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we know that you are the reason for the season. We know that, that you are why we celebrate, why we have Christmas at all. And so God, may we not lose sight of that. May we not get caught up in, in all the decorations and all the fancy things, all the presents and all the things that we have to do. So much so that we lose the sight of you. God, may you be in our holiday celebration. May you be the one that we are seeking after. And God, may we, may we look to you for that satisfaction. God, this season, Christmas is forgiving to one another and forgiving to you. And so God, may we give the best present that we can ever give. May we give ourselves freely and completely. Be with us, God. And may we find the satisfaction that we're looking for as we seek after you and look to you this Christmas. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. God bless you guys and Merry Christmas. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.